Thanks, Walter, for joining us here on Winning Ways today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, scorpion is typically known for its sting. So, I mean, which is very, you know, I mean, from what you do. Uh, so, how, I mean, how did the idea of having a name like scorpion come about? Oh, it's actually a long story, but uh, I was bullied a lot in high school. And a lot of time I didn't react and I didn't fight back. And then one day I lost my temper and I'd been doing full contact martial arts since I was seven. So I guess they saw the sting. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I was uh, named after that because it's an animal with the same traits. It's a very docile creature until pushed too far. And it's fiercely loyal to its cyclone, which is a family of scorpions. So to this day, we still protect other geeks. All right. Today's world where there's so much of social media, how do you really achieve a balance between IQ and EQ? It's a constant struggle. Lots of people are born with naturally good EQ. They're like Bill Clinton, they're charismatic, everyone loves them. And some people are born with high IQ, but usually not the same person. And the person with the IQ will be more risk averse, underconfident, go down the rabbit hole, study one area to the, to the nth degree, be very OCD about it. And the world doesn't reward them necessarily for that. And then the person with the high EQ who's just playing golf and schmoozing with the right people and was on the, on the football team at school and knows everyone but had never read a book, they end up being the CEO. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, that's the way our world works right now. And um, what we're trying to do is recognize the strengths in both of those things and try to take brilliant engineers and round them out enough so they can reach their full potential. So they're still 80% engineer but at least they're 20% EQ. There's so much happening around the whole startup ecosystem. Uh, what, what would it take for you know, somebody to be successful? I mean, is it uh, more of IQ, more of EQ, or has there got to be a very balanced approach? Carnegie Mellon came out with a report on this a few years ago that said 85% of your success is EQ, 15% is IQ. Uh, the book Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell he said that some of the most successful people in the world were 120 IQ. So they were smart enough, but they were well-rounded in every other way. So to be successful, the only way you can hedge your bets is to try and be well-rounded. Or what you've seen a lot is good partnerships, where you have a, a Steve Jobs type who has the vision, the marketing, and the charisma, and on the other side you have a Wozniak type who can actually solder the circuit board together. Now if you can get two of them that are married in terms of as a partnership, for life, you're effectively making one balanced person. Someone who's all EQ is never going to invent anything. You, you were a hacker as a child. And today's environment, I mean, you know, there's so many youngsters who are always there on the net, on the social media, a lot of them, you know, doing a lot of hacking. But where is the fine line? I mean, how do you ensure that children now whom we look up to as, you know, that probably they're going to become geeks because they are hackers now, how do you ensure that they you know, don't go astray when you really try to keep them on the positive side of things? A good engineer at Google can make a million dollars a year. If the government paid cyber white hat hackers that much, they'd have the best ones on the planet. When they don't, and someone wants to make a living for themselves, their family, and their retirement, their choice is to only be a black hacker, hat hacker. That needs to be brought into balance. Unfortunately, that's the reality of the way it'll, it'll turn out. Um, you can't stop kids being curious. Anyone who can code can hack to some extent. And there'll always be an advantage that they have over the general public who don't understand any of this. To them, all technology is indistinguishable from magic. And if everyone's believing in magic, it's easy to fool them. Do you feel corporations are recognizing this and you know, being able to do that in terms of... Not enough uh, and not quickly enough because they still have a HR department with a payment schedule from 1986 that they're still trying to apply with a 5% bonus every Christmas, even though this person protects a $100 million infrastructure and this person over here generates PowerPoints and they're trying to pay them the same. There's so much of malware and cyber attacks which constantly, you know, all corporations are under threat. Uh, so what should corporations really look out for and ensure that you know that they are not the prime targets well the thing is there are no prime targets anymore uh, even the state-sponsored hacking that happens is pretty much targeting anyone with intellectual property 
the ransomware and cryptoware viruses will target anyone who'll pay 500 in Bitcoin. So you could be a dentist in the middle of Ohio and you'll still get hit with it and still have to pay out. And it doesn't matter that you know, you're not targeted as, a, as a, uh, a bank or something like that. And that's a huge myth in the industry. People think they have to be targeted. No, I, I'll spread the virus as widely as I can as long as somebody pays me Bitcoin to clean it up. Um, now, big corporations can certainly improve their risk management, their quality assurance, their disaster recovery, business continuity. And not in theory, and not according to the auditor, and not that I have a white paper on my shelf that says I'm compatible. Actually doing it, actually rehearsing it, actually failing over every quarter and running off your secondary site, and then failing back and making sure the data comes with you. Putting the stuff into practice and making sure it happens. Using migration integrity and segregation of duties inside the company to protect you from your own developers. Many of these corporations, they have all kinds of firewalls externally, but they're paying the developer 80 grand a year. So if someone offers that developer 200 grand to risk losing their job, they're gonna take it. And there's zero consequences for their actions because our government and court system hasn't caught up with technology yet. So those are some of the fundamentals that they need to work on. Actually rehearse and exercise your backups, your restorations, and keep them vaulted, snapshotted, frozen, and separated. Not putting a delta on top of last week's stuff every week, because now you get a ransomware, a cryptovirus, that goes straight into your backup. And you won't know until three months later. Uh, as, a, as a technologist, where would you place your bets on? I mean, in terms of, there's so many new technologies out there on the horizon, right? From artificial intelligence, IoT, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality. I mean, if you were to do a little bit of crystal ball gazing, Cyber isn't going to go away anytime soon. We're only beginning to recognize the damage it can do. And, and we're beginning to see the first cyber weapons be developed. Real national-sized weapons that could kill the critical infrastructure of another country. So that's big business. Self-driving autonomous vehicles in the next five years will totally change industries that we consider normal. If you can Uber everywhere for $2, that's an above-ground subway system. Why would you buy a car? ever. So there goes car dealerships, car parks, valets, car washes, gas stations, tire centers, brake centers. Why do we need any of those if we're going around in electric Ubers that are centrally maintained and cleaned? So if that happens, the next notch up is truck drivers or anyone doing any kind of van or distribution. They're just big Ubers. So that goes next. Now you're at 34% unemployment and the French Revolution started at 20%. So when one in five people can't feed their kids, all things change. So, I mean, that's quite a bleak picture that you're portraying, I mean. You're welcome. So, so is that going to really mean that, you know, maybe in the next five years, uh, I mean, if everything is going to get automated, I mean, there's obviously, I mean, like you said, one in, I mean, 20% in French Revolution. Yeah. Well, the rules will change. Humans will no longer be allowed to drive on the freeway, or they'll be restricted to only the carpool lane because they'll disturb the Ubers and drive up insurance too much. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, not just about driving, not just about yeah. automobiles, but other areas of life. I mean, even these days, coding is also being, you know, I mean, uh, artificial intelligence probably will start doing coding and stuff like that. So, so what will human beings be doing? Well, there'll be a, a very difficult, bloody period in between for everyone who can't code. Hopefully, there'll be, on the other end of this, some... Um, more of a utopia where humans are freed up to do things that are uniquely human. And with the robots doing the work, we don't have to worry too much about salary. Whereas today, 99% of people are just struggling to pay the rent. In between, you can't take a taxi driver and tell him start coding artificial intelligence because Uber just put him out of business because he's not prepared to. And the universities aren't prepared to teach them, not anything modern or new. So we're going to go through a very difficult transition phase in the in, in, the in between. And there's no way around that. It's not, there's no quick way to avoid that. Um, now, that's before you start replacing blue-collar workers in factories. There's an article I read last week where some Chinese factories have now started using those robot arms completely to replace all their staff. Their costs went down 20%, their productivity went up 80%, and their quality went up some similar number. So Moore's Law keeps making these cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and they're just about here in terms of cheaper than human except they work three shifts of production, don't have a union, and don't need vacation or smoke breaks. So what are those people going to do? They would have, in the old days, gone and become taxi drivers. Right. 
in all this? Is there a silver lining? Like I said, eventually, this is part of human evolution. This will be a painful part of it. The silver lining is on the other side of this. Every repetitive job out there will be done by a machine. And then it's a case of what's left and how fairly can we distribute that among the humans that, that are still around. So do you also foresee automation or probably robots coming into agriculture and farmlands and stuff like that? Anything that's remotely repetitive. I mean, if, they can, if we have autonomous vehicles, we can certainly plow a field. You know, maybe they can't raise a horse and, and train it to race. There'll be certain things that are going to be still too non-repetitive and too sensitive that humans need to do it. But most of the mass manufacturing and agriculture now for producing food products for McDonald's or somewhere like that is as automated as it can possibly be. Everything's in cages, everything's in, in conveyor belts, right. every, all the food is poured automatically or released automatically, and all, the, all of this, the Internet of Things is used to control the atmosphere and the spraying of chemicals and so on, because it's cheaper. Every penny counts. Thanks, thanks, Walter. Thank you very <laughs> You're much. welcome. Thank you.